Hello and welcome to Roadmap MBA. My name is Ashley King. I'm so happy to be with you today. I love presenting on the show. I can't remember how many of these I've done. Uh, I've been presenting since March for Roadmap MBA. It's been such a fun journey because I've been able to learn new skills about live presenting, but also I've been able to meet some wonderful people who have you know, been commenting, people I've never interacted with before. So it's really nice to see anyone watching today. Um, I've got a really special topic for you today. It's really close to my heart. It's all about neuro neurodiversity in business and the case for that. Um, I also wanna share some of my own personal reflections on neurodiversity. We're gonna talk about what it is, um, the voices that I believe are really powerful on this subject. And I just wanna have a chat really. So if this is a topic of interest to you, if it's something that you want to share with us or, or share your thoughts or talk to us, or if there's something that resonates that I say that you wanna kind of comment on, please um, you know, let, me, let me know in the comments because I can see them and I can respond to you live. So, um, thanks uh, to those who are, you know, going to be watching and commenting. So it's really great to see you. Thanks so much for tuning in. So as I said, my name is Ash. I am a, a presenter for the Roadmap MBA. Um, I just want to tell you a little bit about the Roadmap MBA quickly because it's a really uh, important thing for you, if, especially if you haven't heard of it. So this amazing uh, resource has been put together by Steve Pugh, the founder of Roadmap MBA. So you can actually um, buy the course and the program. You get classroom uh, sessions, you get all kinds of different resources. You can work through this and all the materials at your own pace. It's really stunning, uh, stunningly put together, a massive labor of love. As someone who did an MBA myself, I would say that there's a lot of concepts with MBAs that can feel so hard to get your head around, to understand, to really get to the the topic quickly and, and with clarity. And I really love how this has been put together. So shout out to Steve, who's the founder of Roadmap MBA for creating this. But more importantly, when you do buy a course, you can actually gift one um, so you, it goes to somebody else. So have a look at the Roadmap MBA website. There are links in the description. Um, but just to tell you about a bit about the mission. So the Roadmap MBA, we're a team now growing. Um, so the founder is Steve Pugh. Um, I am Ashley King. I'm a guest presenter. My colleague Effiani is, uh, or Tony is, as he's sometimes known, he's a presenter as well. Um, and we also have a fabulous assistant. I've just forgotten her name. <laughs> Finn Watson, yeah, who is awesome. She's um, an artist and also she's really into motorsports. So I love to meet different people and this team has been brought together by Steve but it's, it's a really interesting um, you know team and I'm really enjoying it. So as a team we're on a mission to help people around the world to build a better life for themselves to creating an accessible platform for all communities to thrive and celebrate together and this um, Roadmap MBA it provides online programming and also um, online and offline resources for you to use to help you become your best self. So the whole point is to make business education accessible. It's now um, in over 30 countries around the world, really exciting um, and it's just growing and growing. So I'm actually, you're not able to see this, but I'm looking at a map of all of the countries around the world that Roadmap MBA has been posted to and where there are currently learners. And it's so exciting to see some of the countries that um, you know the Roadmap MBA is in now. So Australia, we've got Ghana, we've got areas of um, Eastern Europe, Europe, we've got China, um, Brazil, or uh, further parts of South America, you know, lots of uh, space in North America, um, just absolutely incredible. So I'm so glad to be here. And I just wanted to, to say, share a bit about that, because it's really, really cool to be part of this team as it grows. So I wanted to chat about who I am very briefly for anyone who hasn't met me before and a little bit about what I've been up to um, before I go into this topic. So my name is Ashley King. Um, I like to go as Ash. Um, I'm a podcaster. Um, I guess that's one of the ways that I talk about myself. It's really not a title I ever thought I would have for myself. But it's just amazing what has happened for me as since I started podcasting. 
Um, really, I guess one of the words I would use to describe myself is a chatterbox and a storyteller. And those are real themes that have come up in my life. Um, I have a podcast studio in the northeast of England in a space called the Oosburn, which is quite a creative space uh, in Newcastle upon Tyne. Um, I love to work with people, corporates, to um, create podcast episodes, whether it's a audio and video production series where we'll curate a set and we'll look at the content and we'll get the guest speakers in and we'll have a great time. Um, and that's one of the offers we do, but we also hire out our space to record content, voiceovers, to do books, audiobook recording. There's quite a lot of different things we do, but I'm not really here to talk about that. What I'm here to talk about is uh, neurodiversity in business. And to talk about that, I need to talk about myself. So I actually have ADHD. Um, so if you don't know what that is, it's Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, which comes under the neurodiversity banner. So that's my topic today and what I'm going to talk about. I want to take a quick moment to say hi to Tony. Thanks so much for tuning in, Tony. I've just given you a shout out. I absolutely love your content. I've got so much to catch up on, um, but I'm really looking forward to your views on uh, the banking industry in Nigeria. So thank you so much for um, saying hi. Um, so I just wanted to say, you know, there's, there's a lot that I want to cover today. Um, when, I, when I was sharing a little bit about myself, um, one of the things I've been up to recently is doing a lot of public speaking and a lot of working. And I've been trying to juggle admin and work and public speaking. And these are different skills and it's so important that we develop different skills and we do stuff that isn't easy. You know, we can't always do stuff that we like. We have to do stuff that feels a bit difficult sometimes. But what I've found is by trying to do everything all at once, I've been feeling exhausted. I've actually been very unwell uh, recently. Um, and one of the things that that's had me thinking about is how we value our time, the effort we do, the work we do, which skills we're good at, which skills we might need to outsource. And that's had me thinking a lot about neurodiversity and how as people who um, are neurodiverse or neurotypical, how we might ask for help, how we might work together and collaborate. And so that's what led me to think about this topic today. So I'm really happy to be here. Um, if anyone has any questions about neurodiversity, neurodiversity in business, what it is, uh, any personal experiences they want to share, then please um, you know, drop something in the comments and I can answer you live. I'll try and answer any comments later, but I don't, I can't always do that. So if you've got any thoughts, just drop us a note now. I really like that uh, comment that's just come in. So people with different skills should collaborate. So um, I heard a saying once and I'm really sorry that I can't remember who said it. It might be a famous person. It might just be something I've picked up through different training um, that I've attended over the years. But I, I'm really into innovation. I love to see how we can collaborate. I love to look at how companies collaborate and exchange information. So one of my favorite examples of innovation is the Lego group. They make so much content open source to people so they uh, can play and enjoy and, and collaborate because um, they want people to enjoy their product and also work together. So I think innovation is so important, but one of the, the words or the kind of themes or phrases I've picked up over the years that really matters to me is about diversity and innovation. So actually, diversity of thought, if you have a diverse team around a table, you get conflict, you get friction. That friction becomes a catalyst for innovation. So it might be that you need to uh, communicate in a different way. You need to reanalyze your content. You need to shift things. But it's that diversity of thought and that um, you know, different skill set that comes together and it just makes it a really beautiful um, product. And so if you look, if you think about it like a recipe or, or cooking, you know, if you're making a beautiful meal, there's different ingredients you need. I like to think about that when building teams, you know, who do you need uh, to really make that work? So um, those are some, some really good points. So thank you for, for those commenting. It's really nice to see, uh, see that. Um, so I'm just gonna take a moment And yeah, I love, I love reading the comments because it gives me a moment to have something to drink and also just see what people are saying. So friction can be an amazing tool for growth. I so agree. I actually think you need a catalyst sometimes um, 
we don't grow when we're staying the same, when we're stuck. You know, we want things to, to adapt and actually our, our comfort zone is really important. We need to explore what our comfort zone is. And if you told me a year ago, I'd be live presenting and speaking on the go, I would have said, no way. Uh, it's still scary, I've got to be honest. Um, I find it really exciting because of the skill development you get, but it is scary sometimes. So thanks for anyone watching either now or back later. So I wanted to tell you about a couple of things coming up, just a few shout outs. I like to do these when I can. So um, I know that this um, stream reaches a global audience. I know that whether you're looking at my personal profiles or LinkedIn profile or even the roadmap, MBA profiles, you might be in any country around the world, but I also know we have a lot of people local to the northeast of England. So there's two things coming up that I wanted to give a shout out about. So the first one is the Expo for Good. This is run by Grace House. Grace House is a charity which is in Sunderland. Um, it's actually, a, they've got a brilliant team who are working really hard, but I work most closely with Laura Jane Forbes, who really does an amazing job. What they do is they fundraise uh, to support young people and their families who have learning disabilities. So this could be um, any kind of learning disability or physical disability, but they do really important work to support young people and their families. Um, so I really love working with Grace House. They've been one of my chosen charities for 2022 and um, they have a fantastic exhibition for good. So I go to lots of business exhibitions. I find them a great place to meet people, to network, to learn about other businesses, to go and listen to speakers, um, to, to just meet new contacts. But um, we were actually at the Great Grace House um, Expo for Good event on Thursday, the 20th of October. So my team from Flamingo Heights will be there. We're going to be doing a live pop-up um, audio and video podcast. So if, you've, if you're in the northeast of England and you want to come along, you can actually have a go at being on a podcast for a couple of minutes, which should be really fun. I can't wait to see what people say. Um, and then we also will have LinkedIn professional headshots so you can turn up and get a headshot um, to update your LinkedIn profile picture in exchange for a donation to Grace House. So I'm really excited about that because it supports the charity, but also helps you to get a, you know, an updated profile pic. Um, I'm also speaking at that event. So I'm looking forward to, you know, really giving some time to Grace House that, to, uh, that day. Um, so if you're around, go and check it out. And I hope to see you there. The other event I really wanted to share about is called Micro Businesses Unite that is taking place on the 8th of November in South Shields at the Customs House. If you haven't been to the Customs House before, it's a beautiful venue. Um, I'm doing that uh, with Ian Farrar, who's a podcasting legend to me. Um, he runs the Industry Angel Business Podcast. He also has his own sales and marketing company called Far North. And he wanted to do something to celebrate micro businesses. So actually micro businesses would usually be classed as anything between one to five uh, employees, sometimes one to 10. So uh, there are 27% of the micro businesses in the UK are in the northeast of England. And it's really interesting that it's such a big group in the northeast of England, more than anywhere else in the UK. I'm really curious about that. I wonder if it's because we tend to collaborate a lot in the northeast. Um, but it is great to celebrate those people who are working by themselves or working with small teams to impact um, their communities around them. So if you can make that event, please do come along. It's an event I am speaking at. Um, it's going to be a really fun event. On that event, I'm gonna be speaking to Nicola Jane Little from Mint Business Club. She's another fellow entrepreneur, but she, like me, has a neurodiversity. So it's gonna be a really interesting chat about her business journey, how she got to where she is, and her tips and tricks for anyone interested. So if you're in the Northeast of England, please do come along to either of those events. And thank you so much for listening to that. So let's get into why we're here. So today I'm talking about the business case for neurodiversity, and I'm really excited to be talking about this today. I'm really passionate about inclusion, equality, and diversity, and it's been a journey for me, and it's one that I'm still on. 
there's been uh, topics that have been really close to my heart. I grew up in South Africa um, during the end of apartheid. So racism is a huge issue that I look into regularly, race relations. Um, it's been something that I've always been wanting to learn more about and use my own privilege to create a platform or use um, that to help others. However, neurodiversity as a topic is a very new thing for me and it was not really something I ever expected. So I want to talk to you a little bit about this today and why I think it's important. So why this topic? Um, well, it's the ADHD Awareness Month this October. Um, for me, it's quite a personal thing, ADHD Awareness Month, because around two years ago, at the end of 2020, I was diagnosed with ADHD. So Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, ADHD, can either be one of two kinds. It can be the attention deficit side, or it can be the hyperactivity side, which also has impulsivity attached to it, or it can be combined, um, which is both. And I actually have the combined presentation, which is both the uh, attention deficit uh, parts and the hyperactive impulsive parts. Now, when I was diagnosed with ADHD, I thought I was completely broken. I didn't understand what that was or why it mattered or how I got it or what was wrong with me or did my parents do something wrong or, you know, <laughs> What was the thing? And I didn't like having the label. At the same time, I was so sad. I was really not in a good place, personally. Um, I had been working so hard doing my Masters in Business Administration and MBA at Newcastle University Business School. I had six assignments to get in um, that I had had late. I had to get them done in a three week period. I was drinking two uh, Red Bulls a day. My hair fell out, it was blonde at the time, but it just completely fell out because I was so stressed. And I was trying to do my work and I would just sit there with tears rolling down my cheeks, thinking, what is wrong with you? Why are you so stupid? And I, I just couldn't get it, I couldn't understand. I didn't know why things were so difficult. What I've learned since is that people who have ADHD have different brains and different processing measures or, or ways of processing information um, then maybe others might. So what that might mean for me is that I would spend forever reading, listening to podcasts, chatting to people, socializing the topic that I was learning. So for instance, if I needed to learn about global trade um, or politics, I would listen to the Financial Times podcast. I would listen to uh, all kinds of different podcasts, World Economic Forum briefings. I would go and watch things on YouTube. I would go and read papers. I'd read reports. I'd read white papers. I'd look at things from McKinsey to Deloitte to all of these different conglomerates that were putting out information. I would try to get a really balanced view. I would look at news. I would look at British news. I would look at US news. I would look at Al Jazeera. I would, I would get so much information, but I wouldn't write the assignment until the very last minute, so the night before. And so I thought I was crazy, I thought I was stupid, I thought I was silly, I, I just felt like I wasn't good enough. But it, it wasn't any of those things. I just did things in a different way to what other people did. It didn't mean I wasn't working, it didn't mean I wasn't studying. And having the opportunity to rethink a lot of that once I was diagnosed really helped. But at the time of my diagnosis, I was really not well. I was in a very uh, not mentally safe place. So what I would say is this is why this topic is so important to me and really means a lot to me um, and why I wanted to talk about it today. I also want to talk about it for the purpose of education. So you might have never heard about ADHD or neurodiversity before, but you also might have preconceived ideas. You might be um, in a business or in a, a leadership role. You might be working in an organization where you keep hearing this word neurodiversity and you think, oh my gosh, what is this thing everyone keeps talking about? I don't know what it is. It feels like a bandwagon. It's something I'm hearing a lot. You know, I, I wish people would just stop being on the neurodiversity bandwagon or it's just another thing. You know, there's a lot of views and thoughts out there. So what I wanted to do is talk about this to help um, educate others. 
And also I wanted to shine the spotlight on some awesome activists, researchers and creators that I love to learn about. And I can't wait to share them with you because I love their resources and they've worked so hard to produce them. So the other thing I wanted to say about this topic as a disclaimer is that I am not a psychiatrist. I cannot diagnose anyone. Um, you know, there's lots of resources online about how to get diagnosed. There's things like ADHD UK, Psychiatry UK. There's a lot of information out there. It can feel confusing sometimes. Um, what I would say is I can't diagnose anyone. So just to have that disclaimer, I'm sharing my own lived personal experience. Um, so I won't be able to cover everybody's experience, but it's important to say that because it's it's just a really important thing to say. I want to make sure that you know that if there, if you need support, there is support out there. Um, I want to comment on some of the comments that have come in. So thank you. Uh, it is important to remember we are all good enough wherever we are exactly as we are because we're all working and evolving um, all the time. I, I think that's really important. And Paul King has said, ADHD, you'd need the dopamine rush, which last minute working gives you to get the work done. Uh, Paul King knows me better than anyone, but I think the dopamine rush that you get from a last minute project, I can't even explain it. It's really, really powerful to be in the zone. Um, when I wrote my dissertation, I locked myself in a room for three days and I'd worked on it the entire year, right from before the course even started but I just didn't leave that space for three days. I think I lived on Red Bull and marshmallows and maybe occasional naps. But um, that's not, I'm not saying that that's the right thing for everyone. I think balance is important, but sometimes um, it is important to also go with your body and what you need to do to get the work done. So I'm really glad that we can have this conversation. If you have experienced any of these issues yourself, if you have any thoughts, please drop us a comment. Let me know. Um, it's really interesting to hear other people's ideas. So before we get started in going into some of the stats and facts about neurodiversity, I wanted to introduce you to some of my favorite voices on this matter because there are so many and I could have chosen anyone. I've specifically chosen not to talk about people in my region because I want, I know this is a global audience or a, a, a national audience. So I wanted to share some of the voices that I really respect and I love um, reading their content and learning about. Um, so there are so many and I'm gonna be quoting some of them in this presentation. So I did wanna tell you about them. And so my first person that I want to talk about is Tumi Satir from the Black Dyspraxic. So Tumi is a really good friend of mine. Uh, we met at an Afro-Caribbean uh, networking event at Newcastle University when uh, he'd moved to the uh, area and I was very involved with the society and supporting them in lots of ways. <sighs> Tumi has dyspraxia and dyslexia which can affect his speech, his motor control, his movement. Uh, he is also, as he titles himself, the black dyspraxic. So he speaks of the black experience. He's from Nigeria. So he has the experience of, you know, moving to another country and trying to fit in in a different space. So Tumi has all kinds of his own challenges, but what he talks about that I really value is intersectionality. So when we think of someone, you know, whatever um, challenge they may have, or even uh, our own personalities. We're not just our job title. We're not just a father or a mother or a daughter or a sister. We might have likes and dislikes. We have our favorite um, foods, our favorite colors. We have friendship groups we want to be in, music we like, you know. Um, so I think when Timmy talks a lot about um, intersectionality, it's really important to remember that when we consider a topic like neurodiversity or any diversity, that comes with different labels, different patterns, different likes and dislikes. And it's important that we don't um, speak of a whole group with one banner approach. So Tommy speaks really eloquently about this. Um, he's a health economist for, the, for Newcastle University and I just love his work. Um, so 
One of the quotes that I really like that he talks about, which we'll get into a little bit later, but um, neurodiverse individuals with dyslexia, dyspraxia and ADHD particularly have um, been educated in a system that was ill-designed for them to thrive. So these are Timmy's own words. Um, therefore, people with these learning disabilities will display admirable qualities such as problem-solving skills and determination. So what he's saying is because uh, perhaps classrooms or organizations aren't set up for neurodiverse inclusion, what that means is that actually you have to kind of work other ways out to, to do things, to get them done, to make sure that things are um, met. The other challenge with that though is masking. So you hear a lot about people with neurodiversities who mask their symptoms um, so that they present as organized. Um, I'm going to get into that a little bit later when I talk about my experience with ADHD and what it was like working in a workplace, the challenges I find um, around this. So uh, Timmy worked with uh, Dr. Nancy Doyle, who is another favorite of mine I'll tell you about in a moment. Um, there's a Forbes article I highly recommend if you can look into it. It's called The Intersection of Race and Neurodivergence, The Black Dyspraxic Shares on Overcoming Barriers. And Timmy recognizes the challenges he's had, but also others um, and the types of challenges he's seen. Timmy advocates for many people. He writes reports. He spends a lot of time researching and I love his voice, so um, I really wanted to share him with you. We've got Dr. Nancy Boyle, who's probably my favorite um, working in the neurodiverse space. So the reason I like Dr. Nancy Boyle is because I find her content really accessible. So I have used a, a graph in this presentation, which you'll see. Um, she has very expansive research and easy to understand graphics. She's got uh, resources. She's a coach, she's a speaker, she's a trainer. She's focused on helping people to reach their potential. So she's the founder of something called Genius Within. Um, she's also the co-director of um, the Center for Neurodiversity of Work uh, at work at Burbick School of Business. She is also, um, you know, just really um, voices her opinion with Forbes and other similar um, articles uh, or, or publications like that. And I really like her material because I learn so much from um, Nancy and, and what she talks about. Um, and I really like that, you know, she's doing so much to educate others. She's also um, been recognized in the Queen's Awards for Enterprise for promoting opportunity in 2022. So that is really amazing uh, to get an a, a accreditation like that to support what she does. So for me, I just think she's amazing and I love her work. And I think it's important for us to support um, women founders, um, but also people who are neurodiverse. So I think that's really exciting. We then have Dr. Samantha Hugh, who I really like. Um, so Sam, as she sometimes calls herself, um, she runs ADHD Girls. She's a researcher, a speaker and a trainer. She has uh, an autism, ADHD, dyspraxia, and Tourette's diagnosis. Um, so you can check out her website for some brilliant resources. The one that I would recommend is to actually look at and watch the replay of ADHD Best Practice at Work conference. And um, this talks about struggles that people with ADHD may face, but also there's brilliant resources there for employers, for organizations. So one of the things that I like that she said is neurodiversity means all brains are different. It actually includes all of us. So we have over 86 billion brain cells. So it makes sense that some of us might have genetic just predispositions to certain brain differences. It doesn't mean that we all experience our neurodivergence in the same way. What I like about Sam's comment there and her quote is it recognizes that we all have a unique learning experience, a unique lived experience. And again, it, it really um, cements the work of Toomey, uh, Dr. Nancy Boyle, and Professor Amanda Kirby, and, and many other researchers that we all have different views um, and different experiences and ways of seeing the world. And we need to actually be mindful of that rather than just sticking a label on someone, giving them some meds and thinking that, you know, it's, it's fine and that's the way to do it. So 
We also have uh, two young women that I really am admiring from a distance, um, have chatted to on LinkedIn and I really feel inspired by. Both um, Ellie Middleton and Leanne Maskell, their uh, social networks have exploded in terms of the reach they have. Um, I'm really excited that we have two young women who are speaking about what it is to be a professional, redefining um, business and the workplace from, my, from what I see from the outside in, in such a unique way. So Ellie has um, autism and ADHD. Uh, she has a brilliant community called Unmasked with Ellie. She has a marketing background. She's a community builder, a speaker, and a trainer. So one of the things I like about Ellie is that she first went viral on LinkedIn because she shared a profile picture of herself dressed in quite quirky clothing saying, you know, be just because I have this, just because I have that, doesn't mean I'm not professional. These are the things that make me professional. And she had the hashtag, I am professional. And people started to share that and create similar posts and it connected with people all over the world and LinkedIn actually used her to create a campaign called I am professional. So Ellie has just grown so quickly in terms of her social media reach but with that has come speaking opportunities, speaking engagements. What I love about Ellie is she's raw, she's honest and she's authentic. So she's using that platform and privilege to educate others. If you see her speaking she'll have fidget stones or, or bracelets or things to help her with her autism. One of the things that I like about Ellie is she talks about it like it is. She'll say when things are tough, she'll say things like if you want to, you know, include neurodiversity on your conference agenda, remember that, or you want to hire staff, it's not just about the great things about neurodiversity. There's also the tricky things that come with that. So if you want me to take my mask off, then you actually need to have a space that's psychologically safe for me to have that mask off. And I really love her point of view. Um, she's one of the most exciting voices on neurodiversity that I'm watching at the moment. We also have Leanne Maskell. So um, she's written A to Z of ADHD. She's written the reality manifesto and the model manifesto. She's an author, she's an ADHD um, coach, she's a speaker and a trainer. What I love about Leanne Steff is she speaks again really openly, bravely and it's real. So you'll see pictures of her messy room or the stress of missing trains or uh, you know she recently ran a retreat and how she prepared for that and the stuff she had to do and the things that went wrong and I think it really gives a unique view of what it's like with ADHD. Leanne's also experienced eating disorders, which is through being a model. So talking about how when we look in, on Instagram or in um, beautiful magazines, we don't realize that we're judging ourselves as older women compared to a 13 year old girl. So for Leanne, she speaks about what it was like being a model, you know, growing up and worrying about her body all the time and how this has impacted her mental health. And it's interesting when we talk about uh, neurodiversity to look at the comorbidities with other issues. So if you look at autism, there are connections with eating disorders. If you look at um, many uh, things that we get diagnosed for or we struggle with, there are different um, things that they connected to, which I'm gonna go into in more detail. So these are two uh, women I really feel excited by and I love watching them. And I think it's important to say that of those voices that I've shared, there are so many more. I know so many amazing people talking about neurodiversity, but these are the ones that connect with and resonate with me the most that I wanted to share with you in case you're not aware of them. I think it's also important to recognize that a lot of the research that's out there is written from the male perspective. It's also written from a white male perspective. Now that's not to say that the research is racist or that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is the research has only been focused on one particular demographic. That might be because the access to support, to funding, um, it hasn't been there. And so when we think of ADHD, for example, but there are other um, conditions which might fall into this as well. You have the, the issues that a lot of people will identify a particular, um, you know, uh, a particular thing like young boys who are naughty in the classroom or you might have with autism. You might expect that someone's super clever and awkward 
But you have different levels of intelligence, which is why we, we need to be careful when we say things like high achieving or high functioning or low functioning. Um, because if someone has barriers, they have barriers regardless, but it's an um, individual journey for everyone. So what I like about these researchers is, uh, you know, they are new voices. If ADHD in girls is not being diagnosed, then we, we need to learn more about it. And that's why I love Dr. Sam Hughes' voice on this, because she talks so eloquently about the ways that we can better support girls and women in schools, which is why there's also been such a big increase in ADHD in women. The um, diagnosis rates have been off the charts. So I've been really interested to watch that. There's just been so many people that I keep talking to who've been diagnosed recently or they're waiting on the list. And what is the key behind that? Well, we have an amazing social media platform systems where we can talk to each other faster. So people might see something on TikTok or on YouTube or on a Facebook or LinkedIn live stream and think, hang on, I have that trait. That sounds like me. I thought I was just messy or I thought I really struggled with this thing, but actually, is there something behind this? Is there something I didn't know? So I think using our voices is really important, but I'm really loving seeing that as the research develops, not only are we hearing the stories of women, um, you know, of um, ADHD and girls, but we're also hearing the stories of people like Timmy and his lived experience. He is a health economist and a researcher who is using his lived experience to inform research that really matters. So instead of just having papers and research uh, that's written about it from the viewpoint of observing a patient, um, what we're seeing is people who are actually experiencing these symptoms writing the research. And this is quite a shift and I'm really excited about that. So what is neurodiversity? This graph is from Genius Within. As I said, go and check out their resources. I absolutely love them. There are so many amazing resources there. Um, so neurodiversity can be different types of thinking, but remember, there is the importance of intersectionality. So um, according to Genius Within, the newer minorities are dyslexia, so that might be visual thinking, creativity, and 3D mechanical skills. These are the strengths, by the way, of these, these things. We have um, authenticity, which is similar with ADHD. So you have authenticity, attention, it's, um, creativity, hyper-focus, energy, and passion. We have um, Tourette's, which has, also has hyperfocus, observational skills, cognitive control, and creativity, and innovative thinking. We have acquired disabilities, or um, acquired neurodiversity, so that might be if you've had an accident and you develop a condition, maybe you've um, had a brain injury and you develop a neurodiversity, that can, um, one of the strengths and gifts of that can be adaptability, empathy for others, and resilience and innovative thinking. We also think of a newer minority of mental health, so that could be things from anything from borderline personality disorder um, to uh, bipolar disorder, post-traumatic stress disorder, um, depression and anxiety. So with those things, we have a depth of thinking, expression, sensory awareness, and also resilience. We have things like autism, which is concentration, honesty, fine detail processing, memory, and sensory awareness. And we have um, dyspraxia or DCD. We have verbal skills, empathy, intuition, honesty, and um, we also have dyscalculia, which is innovative thinking and verbal skills. So what you see here is a list of all these different groups. And so these groups are called neuro-minorities and they come under the banner of neurodiversity. So it's a really interesting um, banner and big group and with each of those things we have strengths but we also have challenges now if you look at this group and all of these strengths that are listed what could we be adding to the workplace with some of these skills if you could have people who have 3d mechanical skills or who have um, the ability to remember images and pictures and just draw them and create something from an idea to reality or who might not be able to verbalize what they think, but can visually communicate it. 
Or what if you have people who are extremely empathetic and can network or communicate with others in a way that really connects with them? So these are all amazing skills that these new minorities have. And I think there's so much to be harnessed in business. But for many of these groups, there's limits and limitations that block um, success. So that could be being able to express yourself, being able to ask for help, boundaries, impulsive behavior. It could be things like knowing how to ask for what you need, having reasonable adjustments. Well, how do you even do that? So there's, there's so many things to think about here. And this is why intersectionality is so important. So you could have any of those things. You could have all of those things uh, or three or, or four of those things. You can also have your own separate identity or other labels. And this is why we need to treat neurodiverse um, folks as an individual and help them with a one-to-one -one approach that's individualized and tailored because what might be okay for one person might not be the same for others. So with ADHD, I love to chat and I love to talk to people, but I have the ADHD hyperactive impulsivity side is, is a bigger part of my personality than the ADD, but I'm still combined representation. Now, there will be people who are also ADHD who don't like to socialize as much, who might prefer to be more introverted. So if we make um, accommodations in the workplace for ADHD folks that they get to chat and they get to do X and Y and Z and you know they, they get to have these bright meetings and bright colors, if you have someone who is really sensitive to sensory overload, they kind of struggle with all of the noise and all of the sounds and all of the, you know, smells and colors. So it's really important that we treat the person um, with what they're going through. I wanted to share some stats about neurodiversity. So this is from uh, Dr. Nancy Joyle from Genius Within. But 90% of disabilities are invisible. So we often think when we think about disabilities, we think about people who maybe are less able in some way. So maybe they have um, you know, a motor control issue. Maybe they might struggle to access something. So you might see that they're in, in a wheelchair or they use a, a walking stick or, or they need some support. But many disabilities are invisible and we don't realize. Now, 5% of the population have ADHD, which is like me. One to 2% of the population is autistic. 10% of the population are dyslexic. 5% of the population are dyspraxic. 1 to 2% of the population have Tourette's syndrome. 7% of the population have mental health needs. I would argue it's possibly quite a lot more than that. Um, and then also we have 5% of the population have an acquired brain injury. And acquired means it's not something they asked for. It's something that was developed in their life. So if you look at these stats, that's pretty scary in the sense that if we as businesses are only creating systems and structures and organizations with one point of view in mind, how do we support our staff? How do we get the best out of people? How do we reach the results? How do we get things done? So looking at these stats from Dr. Nancy Doyle, I just find them amazing because to me, it opens my eyes to opportunities out there, but also how much work we need to do as organizations and as leaders to equip our workplaces because all of the beautiful creative skills that come with these uh, different newer minorities, Imagine if we could use those and harness them to work with our teams, with our staff. Imagine the amazing products we could innovate and the way, the world, uh, the way we can change the world. So this is really interesting to me. Do check out Genius Within because they have fabulous uh, research. So I wanted to reflect briefly on my personal journey with neurodiversity. So mental health, you know, this is a big issue for women who are not diagnosed with ADHD. So for many women, the reason they're not diagnosed with ADHD is because they're young girls who maybe are um, very, very talkative, which is what happened for me. I was always chatting. I was always in detention for chatting. I just wanted to talk all the time. And if I had a subject or something that was of interest, I would just focus on it and talk about it for days and days and days. And 
what happened for me in the mental health system is that I would just be diagnosed with one label after another and given, you know, prescription drugs for anxiety meds or depression meds. But actually, all of that time, it was ADHD, but I didn't know that. And this happens so often for women and, and young girls. And it's because there's a limited research, which is why I'm so excited about the up and coming research that is developing by some of the researchers I mentioned earlier. So I would say um, Dr. Samantha Hugh covers this really well in a lot of her resources, but she talks about mental health, PTSD, uh, sorry, take that back. She talks about mental health and the journey of many women who are forgotten, who don't progress as they should in the workplace, who don't progress in their education, who are a lost generation because they've forgotten about, because they don't m meet the ordinary uh, expectations. And what is ordinary? You know, what, what do we expect from people? So I believe that I was stupid. I believe that I just didn't fit in, I was too much, and I just became even more introverted. Now I'm naturally, I love people, I want to know everything about them. People light my whole world up. But if you just don't understand the world around you, and if you don't understand the interactions you're having, that can be a very difficult place. So with my own neurodiversity, as I said, I was on lots of waiting lists, I went through lots of different psychologists, lots of different diagnoses, when one diagnosis which would have helped is that I was ADHD if that had been picked up earlier. I also have a diagnosis of PTSD which means that I am a neurominority with another challenge so that is um, something which is mental health. Um, so post-traumatic stress disorder it's not something I ever planned to have, it was life experiences, but this has an impact on how we see the world when we've got all these different things that come into a package. I also suspect I have dyscalculia. I don't think it's, um, I, I'm not pursuing a diagnosis in that, I don't think it's necessary, but dyscalculia is a struggle with, um, with money. And actually for me, I spent so long in all of my assignments uh, in the library, locked away, working on my accountancy work, and I can do it, I can get really fantastic grades, but it just doesn't sink in, and I don't see money and finances in the ways that others do. Um, the way that I count, or the way that I work out mathematical questions, is often long-winded and in a different way, and I have to do things in visual ways to do with math that others might be able to just calculate very quickly. One of the things that I always worry about is what if I never reach my potential? And when I speak to people, this is one of the biggest things that I hear. This is one of the biggest words, that exact phrase, what if I never reach my potential? And it's that same phrase repeated over and over and over again. There is the saying, how can you uh, judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, right? That is the, the, a great example of this because if we think that we haven't met our potential because we haven't fit in a particular framework or world view that was created by somebody, well, who says what that should be? Who says what those guidelines are, those boundaries are? You know, this is a really important thing. How can we judge ourselves by somebody else's success or perceived success? So I think this is a really important thing to talk about, you know, how do we define success and how do we define success for neurodiverse groups as well. Because it's ADHD Awareness Month and I personally have ADHD, that is the biggest focus of my presentation. So there's lots of other neuro minorities. If you have one and you want to talk about it, please do share in the comments. Um, I'm always looking to learn new resources, but I want to focus on ADHD because that's where my um, neurodiversity is and where my level of knowledge is. So again, this is a graph from Dr. Nancy Doyle from Genius Within. Fabulous resources, please go and look at them. Um, so one of the things that, um, some of the things that are tricky for people with ADHD, memory, money can be a challenge, impulsivity, organizational skills, time management, stress, concentration, listening and taking notes. So the blue circles in this graph are um, things that people with ADHD might struggle with, whereas the purple, um, the purple bits are things that are strengths. So we have 
with ADHD so many strengths that I've seen myself. But for instance, alertness and ability to hyperfocus is, I can't tell you what it's like when that kicks in. It's the most amazing thing. I wish I could bottle that feeling. So when I opened my podcast studio, I signed the paperwork and in five weeks I had built a space from nothing. I'd sourced furniture, I'd physically, you know, built furniture, painted, um, organized, unboxed things, you know, created strategies. In five weeks, it's amazing what you can do when you can hyperfocus. But with that hyperfocus, there always comes a, a, a low after. There, there is passion and enthusiasm, so much enthusiasm. Sometimes for some people, it's a little bit too much. There's problem solving abilities. Well, we can't do it this way. What if we just try that? You know, really innovative solutions, strong 3D visual school, skills. So being able to just visualize and create things. Um, so those are some of the great things. Um, the alertness is wonderful and I love that. I'm very good in an emergency situation as I have been many times. However, what I find um, tricky is when it's the middle of the night and you can't sleep because you're too wide awake and you're too alert. Some of the challenges with ADHD, and this is a small amount of challenges, there's so many, but taking on too much is something I'm really guilty of. You know, thinking I've got so much time in the day when actually I don't. And so learning to have boundaries and learning to really plan out things can be challenging. Lacking attention to detail. So that's really interesting one, because if it's something that I'm interested in, like podcasting, the attention to detail can be enormous. I can study it, I can learn it, I can become an expert at it, I can research, I can discover new things, and I could read about it for hours. But if it's something I'm not interested in, I just don't pay that attention. A difficulty with people and appearing rude. So this can be uh, interjecting in uh, social situations, interrupting, it can be speaking over people, and it's not maybe the way it's perceived. It's more that it's an excitement to share something, or when you hear a story and you want to respond with a story of your own, it's a, an attempt to relate and to build rapport and to create a connection with someone, but that can be taken um, in a very different way. So this is something that I'm working on myself. Difficulty concentrating is important. You know, uh, gr again, growing up through school, I was always in trouble for daydreaming or just looking out the window, but I was bored, I wasn't stimulated. So I think these are some interesting strengths and challenges, but there's so much research till, still to come and to develop, and there's so many lived experiences to pay attention to. So there's a resource that I like called Attitude, A-D-D-I-Tude. So um, for ADHD Awareness Month, they've put some stats together. There's lots more, but I've put in the ones that I think are most important to me. So they've got a campaign called ADHD Loves Company. So like many um, themed months, you know, there's a lot of noise out uh, on social media. You can look at so many different pieces of content which can feel the same. What I'm talking about today is um, with ADHD Loves Company, their campaign this um, October ADHD Awareness Month is about ADHD and the things that come alongside ADHD. So anxiety, depression, learning disabilities or disorders, autism, trauma and more. As I've already shared with my own ADHD, there is a connection with my ADHD and with trauma. So ADHD only exists alone about 25% of the time. That's Teresa Cerulli. Both dyslexia and ADHD can show up as difficult paying attention. Cheryl Chase. There is a, a statement we must properly screen for and address ADHD and its comorbidities at the same time. So this is really important because people might be struggling with ADHD symptoms, but there might be other things that are actually exacerbating that issue. People with childhood ADHD are nearly twice as likely to develop a substance misuse or substance use disorder. This is something that I really worry about. If you look at stats about prison populations, it's really sad to see that there are lots of um, people who have ADHD that's been undiagnosed who are in the prison population. Why is it that some people do 
uh, perform well with their ADHD and others end up in prison. And this is an important piece of work that I think Timmy speaks on really well. So Timmy talks about the access to diagnosis, the access to information, to support systems, to um, job opportunities. If you aren't able to get a job and there is massive unemployability um, rates and you're hungry and you need food and you need to support your family, there are people who will be tempted by crime. If you don't have a support structure around you growing up or you've been exposed to trauma or your lived, your circumstances around you are already difficult, there are routes to crime. So it's really important that we deal with uh, ADHD as people are young and help them to be the best versions of themselves. At the moment in the UK, we've got three year waiting lists for people to be diagnosed with ADHD. It's a massive issue and the resources are so stretched. So what can be done? We are very fortunate in the UK that we can pay uh, for prescriptions. So a lot of our prescriptions are subsidized by the National Health Service, the NHS. But when you go through diagnosis, NH the, the drugs that you require um, to take your medication for ADHD, they can be so expensive if you buy them privately. I know for myself, when I was first diagnosed, I went through a private process. And sometimes I would pay over a hundred pound a month for my ADHD medication. On top of that, I would also have to pay a psychiatrist to write a private pres prescription. So it can be really expensive. So that access to diagnosis, to support, to medication, to health, to knowing where to go, to knowing that there could even be something wrong and it's not something wrong with you, it's just a chemical imbalance in your brain or a difficulty in your brain. These are really important things that not everyone has access to that information. So that's why I really, really love Timmy's work on this. Bipolar disorder and ADHD share some characteristics of moodiness, irritability and emotionality. So I am one of three women in my, in my family who have been labeled or diagnosed with bipolar when that might not be the case or it may have similarities. Um, there are many diagnoses that are called a diagnosis of exclusion where it's actually detrimental to have that diagnosis because you feel you can't talk about it. So Timmy talks about this really well. Um, Co-occurring autism and ADHD carry unique implications and considerations that don't exist for either condition on their own. So this is saying that if you have ADHD and if you have autism, it's not just treating the ADHD symptoms and the autism symptoms and thinking everything's going to be fine because when you have both together, there are unique challenges that that person might experience rather than someone who is um, only autistic or only ADHD. So again, it's really very much an individual approach. Differences in sensory processing may undermine the acquisition of skills of a higher order from behavior to learning. So again, this is about how we learn, how we process, how we um, see information, feel it, visualize it, how we experience the learning journey. ADHD is a tailor-made, sorry, is tailor-made for anxiety because things that seem straightforward can often be problematic. This is something I identify with so much. I would often feel growing up that there was something dramatically wrong with me because things that people would find so easy, I would just find so difficult, um, such as getting ready for school. So there's little things that families can do, like having um, their, uh, a picture, a photograph of what being ready for school looks like or having all of the school items in one place where you know where to go and there's lots of things you can do and there's lots of great resources out there. Depression may result, may manifest as a result of ADHD but it's sometimes called secondary depression so I identify with that. I've been treated for depression before when actually it was undiagnosed ADHD so this is why it's really important we get people the right access um, that they need. It's very hard to shut off the ADHD mind. The more we think about something, the more awake we get. This is absolutely an issue for me. Um, I couldn't stop thinking about ADHD and neurodiversity this morning. 2 a.m., 3 a.m., just thinking and thinking and thinking and thinking and so much information. So that is a huge issue for people with ADHD and other uh, neurodiversities as well. Sleep can be very difficult. 
roughly half of all children with ADHD will also develop ODD, so Organisational Defiance Disorder, or Conduct Disorder, which may explain, as we spoke before, about the issues in prison, with the prison population having ADHD. Up to 17% of trauma-exposed children meet ADHD criteria. This, to me, is a really personal one and very sad because I am a survivor of trauma, um, sexual assault, and I feel that it's sad to me that so many children who go through that may develop ADHD or experience ADHD or fit the criteria for ADHD. So there is a connection between ADHD and trauma and that makes me really sad how many um, broken families and people who are struggling we have. So I wanted to talk about some advice for employers. These are also from some stats from Genius Within, so Dr. Nancy Doyle. Do you know that many neurodiverse conditions are actually covered by the Equality Act? So neurodiversity isn't a buzzword that corporates need to fix and just throw money at and look like they virtue signaling and all this kind of thing. It's actually really important to do because it's about looking after people uh, who are disabled um, and it's covered by the Equality Act, which requires you to put in place measurements. So it's not a choice to put in place measurements. You should put these things in place. The responsibilities of an employer are tricky and there are some um, re resources coming up. But I wanted to share that Dr. Nancy Joyle from Genius Within, she found in her research, when employers are supported, they can thrive. So rather than thinking that they're stupid or they can't do this or they can't do that or why are they always late or why do they do this this way or why are they so disorganized? If you use those skills in the right way and support them, Nancy found that you have 25% will get promotions, 61% improvement in performance and that is the managers who have actually noticed that. It's not self-reported. 117% will see an improvement in stress so this is amazing because we know that stress is a massive issue in organisations. It's something we really need to work to look out for. We know that we have um, really high suicide rates. We've got people who are taking time off on sick. These are a cost to organisations. So if we support our employees who are neurodiverse, this will massively help them to be the best in their workplace. Before we think about our organisations, we need to think about schools and universities. Are we setting kids up to succeed? This is another reason why I love the uh, Roadmap MBA, which I'm presenting for. So this wonderful book that I was talking about, the way it's laid out is very easy to read because it goes through things, it explains jargon, it talks about um, information, but there's lots of visual tools and it's very clear to understand. When we think about how we access information, are we giving our learners, whether they are in schools or whether they're old, uh, older at university, are we giving them information in a way that they can understand? I went to a great talk recently. Um, uh, it was, I can't remember um, the speaker right now, but it was, he uses code to create music. And this was so inspiring to me. So this was at the Bright Ideas Conference in, in Durham recently. And it was really incredible that he used code to make music um, and actually program music, but he uses that to teach children how to learn to code. And to me, that is a great way that we can help connect children and learning in a way that is accessible. So some of the things we could do, allow processing time. So if you want ask a child to read a chapter in 10 minutes at school in the reading time, and then you want them to give you an answer or tell you something, sometimes we might need more time to process that information. So for instance, that might be relevant to autism. We need to teach inclusivity and tackle bullying. I have so many friends with children who talk about the bullying that the kids go through on a daily basis and I think sometimes we accept bullying as a fact of life, but really, should it be that way? Imagine if we could all respect each other's differences and celebrate them and work together. It's important for teachers and for 
uh, us in workplaces to be aware of learner body language cues. You know, do they seem like they're interested or not? Are there ways that we can engage them? Um, we need to update research on girls and with ADHD. This is a huge thing that I'd love to see in schools. Students with a neurodiversity may process information in different ways. So this could be challenges with reading, speech or spelling. So if, for instance, you need to do a test, could you do it in some way by talking it through rather than uh, a paper test? It's also important to be mindful of sensory stimulation like lights, smells and noises. This is a really key thing to think about. Some tangible things that businesses can do, whether you're employed or self-employed, are to get educated as much as you can. Learn about neurodiversity from people who are actually neuro neurodiverse. This is a massive thing. Why would you go to a training session, you know, five hours training by someone who doesn't have a neurodiversity and don't actually know what it's like to have that issue? That might mean that they are presenting research and material, but they don't know what it's really like, so they can't be empathetic and really show you what it, what it would feel like for that person. It's also imp important that if you're working with people who are neurodiverse, pay them. They're a minority group as well. So please, if you're working with people, don't ask them to turn up and speak and do it for free. Um, for exposure, exposure doesn't pay the rent. Please pay um, these researchers because they spend a lot of time and money into, into working and learning so that they can make the world a better place. Allow flexible working for your teams. Have clear communications to say what you mean. This is something I see so many organizations do wrong. When we have um, very uh, unclear information, when we have information where there's inference expected, so you might write something like an email and it's a little bit and clear, um, it makes it very difficult for people. It's also where gossip can happen because people don't have the opportunity to understand. So they fill in the blanks with information that isn't actually there. So when you need something, say it. Say when you need it by, what time you need it by, um, and put it in really simple to understand language and bullet points. Support staff with access to work applications if that's applicable to you. So in the UK, we have access to work, which is provided by the Department of Work and Pensions. That's a really brilliant scheme. Um, you can either apply for that through your organization, uh, your HR department, or um, if you're self-employed, I really recommend um, a, a space that I use called This Is Me Agency. They've helped me so much because what they do is they've partnered me with a support worker. So some of the things that I find so difficult, like emails and staying on track with things and projects, they will actually help me to have a support worker. Um, so I have a brilliant support worker called Zara and she helps me so much uh, with just keeping sure that I'm on top of things, but also making sure that she's scheduled breaks for me and I have the opportunity to have rest in my day or that I get to things. It's important as well if you have neurodiverse staff to provide coaching where relevant, but also provide reasonable adjustments on a case by case basis. It could be something simple like providing yellow note paper for your dyslexic staff so that they can write in black ink, or it could be making sure your website is inclusive and the, the fonts are accessible. There's lots of things that you can do. What can organizations do when recruiting? They can allow applicants to submit their application in different mediums rather than a 250 page application form, uh, similar for grants as well. I think this is really important in funding applications. Look at audio or video files or other methods or mediums of actually completing that application. You can also provide interview application questions in advance. So if you're gonna have an interview, give people questions in advance so that they can prepare for them. This is quite an emerging trend in recruitment at the moment. And I feel really excited about that. A lot of people get nervous about interviews. So having those questions helps them to feel prepared. Assign tasks best suited to their skill set. So if you have somebody who you want to, for instance, be a business development manager, which is something that I really like doing, going and selling things, networking, I'm really good at speaking to anyone from all walks of life. However, if you ask me to make sure that I've got all the paperwork up to date and it needs to be a really complex form per person I meet, I would really struggle to get through that paperwork. 
So make sure you assign tasks best suited to the skill set, but I have a caveat with that because this is tricky if your applicant has not been honest. So if someone is looking for a job, there's a lot of unemployment, they're applying for 80 jobs and they're just trying to put themselves out for anything, they'll take anything. Sometimes what happens is organizations will recruit someone who doesn't have the skill set, they haven't confided in the organization about their neurodiversity and they can really struggle. So it is important to be mindful of matching people to the right role. Educate yourself and your staff. Onboard your staff, not just neurodiverse staff, but all of your staff to give them um, relevant information before they start. Outline processes to ask for help if anyone needs it. Have mental health first aiders and first aid training so that everyone in your teams know what to look out for if things are tricky. Provide clear and simple language and visual charts or graphs where possible. This is really important. Use bullet points. It's a great way to get your message across really quickly. Reduce the amount of emails you have in red tape. This is important. Wherever you can, be more um, process oriented. So this is what I love about working with Steve Pugh, who's the founder of Roadmap MBA. He engineers everything to within an inch of perfection. And I love it because I learned so much about lean processing as a small business. This is really helpful to me. Tackle issues as they arise rather than waiting a long time. I found this really important. I've been on the receiving end of feedback that was six months earlier. Something had happened, I'd said something and it had been misunderstood. I was really enthusiastic and it was taken in the wrong way. And when it was brought to my attention, it was six months later in a promotion interview and I didn't get the job, but I was completely shocked at the feedback because no one had ever discussed it with me before that time. So if you have issues with a team member, ask them about it but talk to them at the time rather than waiting a long time because people forget things and it can be too late to share that feedback. What about psychological safety? This is really important. So Jody Hill from Thrive Law is another voice I really like about ADHD. So I interviewed Jodi a little while ago and we spoke about her ADHD and we both have um, PTSD as well and our experience of that. Jodi never fit in an ordinary law firm. <laughs> She's now created her own space. She wears very bright clothing. She is very um, powerful as a person and she speaks very openly about mental health and mental health in the workplace. But is it safe to tell your workplace? Can you actually confide in your colleagues or your manager? How will they keep your information confidential? Do you want it to be confidential? How will you tell your colleagues? Do you want to tell them? So for instance, do you want to tell your colleagues, please don't interrupt me during the workday, I'll chat to you at break time. That's something I used to say, because that means that once I'm interrupted, I can't start again. So there is a stat that the average manager gets interrupted eight times in an hour. And I would say that is so much more now that we have Slack and we have WhatsApp groups and we have Teams channels and we have phone calls and emails and LinkedIn and social channels. It's probably much more than that. You might have managers who are in meetings back to back all day and then have to catch up on an inbox of 300 emails and all of those notifications. I know for me, that was what led to me working till 2 a.m. every day. And it was exhausting. And that's one of the reasons why I am self-employed is because I couldn't cope with the demand of the communications. And I find that really interesting because I love working in organizations and I know I bring a lot to the table. It's important for us to have inclusive language. So we have neurotypical versus neurodiversity. So some people really don't like those terms. So when we talk about neurotypical, we mean people who are really standard in terms of what they require, they, they, the general population, they think in a particular way. Neurodiversity is all of the neuro minorities that I spoke of earlier. So we've got so many different groups there and we've got some great stats earlier in this presentation. But looking at how many different members of our population have neuro minorities, it's important to realize that yes, there, the majority of people are described as neurotypical, there are a group of neuro minorities who struggle with different challenges and that comes under the umbrella term neurodiversity. So some people dislike the term neurotypical, some people do like it, some people don't like this neurodiversity, some people do like it. 
You'll also hear the term neurodivergent, which is very similar to neurodiversity, which talks about different ways of thinking. It's interesting to see that LinkedIn, for instance, have now added a skill, neurodivergent thinking or dyslexia, um, to the uh, skill set that you can choose from. And I think that's quite a brave move as a corporate to show that these are skills, you know. Um, again, Timmy spoke about the importance of intersectionality, but it's about remembering that we're all different. So for me, for instance, I'm a female, I'm white, I'm also disabled. I don't like that term because I, I feel able. But in technical terms, as research says, and as character classifications say, I am actually disabled. I have a post-traumatic stress disorder, which is a mental health challenge. I experience flashbacks, nightmares, and, and other challenges associated with that. I also have a different way of thinking, which is a neurodiversity, which is attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, ADHD. So I am all those things, but I also have my own dreams and plans and I have friends and I have family and I have likes and desires. So that intersectionality is important. We need to really consider the lived experience about um, that newer minorities have. So there's a lot of talk about language. So you have some groups who want to be known as someone who is autistic and then you have someone who might want to be described as a person with autism. So there's a lot of discussion about the disability first or the person first. Similarly, we don't just have issues with language, we have issues with symbols too. So there's an issue with the jigsaw piece that you'll sometimes see certain neurodiverse groups using because it can be offensive to other groups where we're not a puzzle to be solved. We are solved, we're okay, we're enough already. So why would we need to solve us as an as a issue? And so there are things around symbology and you know um, I, images that we see but also language and then something that's all over social media that I see all the time is this is a neurodiversity a superpower or is it a disability uh, I have described my ADHD as a superpower in the past the ability to hyper focus the ability to be super empathetic enthusiastic all these different things Nowadays, I, I'm less likely to use it as a superpower. I don't think I like to call it a disability. I just feel like I'm just me and I want to be seen as me and I want to do the best work I can and be the best version of myself without all of the labels. The labels have provided an understanding of the world that I didn't have before and it's been so powerful and helpful. But I don't think it's, it's helpful to me to only live in a label and what is expected. So it's really a personal uh, opinion and I'd love to hear anyone watching if you have any thoughts on any of that. So we're nearly uh, wrapping up but I just wanted to finish with a little bit about my personal journey with neurodiversity. So I've shared in this presentation that I was diagnosed with ADHD uh, in around October 2020. It was at the end of my um, MBA and I feel it saved my life, I really do. I was not in a good place. It helped me to finish the work that I had really struggled to do. I was able to, well, I used credit cards. I was a student at the time. I probably shouldn't have, I'm still paying this off, but I went through um, using credit cards to access private healthcare. So I spoke to my local NHS center about ADHD, thinking I had it, and they said that it would be a three year waiting list. I'd already been through that with other diagnoses and I thought, I'm not gonna go through this again. I really need some help. I'm worried about myself. So I, I put it on a credit card and I went to a psychiatrist, um, Harley Street Clinic in London, and I was diagnosed and on medication in five days. The very first time I took medication, it changed my life. I felt like, wow, is this what it's like for people who are normal? Is this what it's like? Is, you know, I was able to plan things and, and get out of bed and do things with a, a lot more clarity and, and I could work out what the steps were. So for me, I always felt like I had over 300 ideas all at once. It was so noisy and chaotic and I just couldn't stop thinking. I just couldn't stop the noise. And even at night, I couldn't stop the noise. So I would sometimes drink to stop the noise. 
it was just such a noisy space in my brain and I had all these ideas and I was just running, running, running and constantly exhausted and cycling through burnout. What I found was that actually when I had that medication, when I got the help and support I needed, those ideas went from say 300 to three and those three ideas I knew how to carry out and I knew how to execute and I knew what the steps were and I really felt that that was a game changer and it's helped me to turn my business around from a failing business where I had an events company um, and you know I was doing everything for free and I was making beautiful spaces but I hadn't done market research and I wasn't running the business well to a business that is now making a profit. It's still in its early days, but you know, I hope to see that grow year on year as it has been. So I really believe that ADHD has turned everything around for me. Um, and I think it's important to celebrate that. How I cope with the girl in the mirror, I wanted to leave you with this because for many people with neurodiversity, um, it's a really big issue. We see a lot of suicide. Um, with women in, with ADHD, suicide is an issue for society in general, particularly with men. Um, but I know that women with ADHD are more likely to attempt suicide. So I feel it's really important for me to finish this conversation by talking about how I cope with the girl in the mirror. So I want to say that some of the things I do is um, <laughs> recently I sat and wrote down all of the free things I've been doing for people, ways I've been giving, talks I've been doing, just all kinds of things and just making a list and then actually putting a price next to that um, and also writing a column of all the things I do to get to that point. So if it's doing a talk, how do I get there? How much does it cost me? How much time do I spend preparing? How long do I spend chatting to people? How long do I spend setting up? And what I've discovered is that list is way too long because I also wrote a list of all the things that I'm sad about in my life and the things that I feel I could do better. And one of those things is spending time with family and friends. I would love to do that more. So it's really important for me to cope and hopefully for anyone listening, this might resonate or help, but setting boundaries and valuing your time is important. Write a list of all your free activities if you'd like to and why you're doing them. Sometimes it's an indication that there's something else, some other need that you're trying to fill. Prioritize time in nature and exercise. So for me, I walk to and from work. It's good for the planet, but it's good for me. At the moment, I feel quite unfit doing that, but I can feel myself getting healthier and healthier. And I know that it's so important for me to get those steps in. I do about 12,000 a day and I love it. Restricting caffeine intake is really important to help with sleep. I ban Red Bull now. Um, I'm not able to drink it anymore because um, I need to be mindful of what I'm putting in my body and the sugars and, and all of the, the things that affect your mood are really important to stay balanced and eat regularly. Limit alcohol to limit impulsivity. If you struggle with ADHD or impulsive behavior, that's been a big thing for me. So if I know that uh, once I've had a drink, I might spend money on something like an impulsive purchase. If I'm not drinking alcohol, I don't have that same um, temptation. I really swear by a gratitude journal. I do this every day, write down what I'm grateful for that day. Sometimes it's the power to write, to know how to write, to, to be able to communicate with people, to be able to express myself, to have paper to write on, to know and have learned how to write and communicate. I use a daily dundas, dun, sorry, daily done list, which is really important to me. Sometimes I feel like I've achieved nothing. And what I do is I write a daily done list of all of the things that I've done. And I think, gosh, I've done absolutely loads. But what that does is it gives me evidence to make a decision about where I might need to readjust my priorities. So if I've put too much in my diary and I haven't given myself time to do things, then actually I might need to adjust something and make uh, a meeting 90 minutes rather than 30. But in other ways, rather than just chatting about something for no reason, I might reduce meetings otherwise. So those daily done lists help me to be productive, but they also give me information which helps me run my business better. Uh, be honest with your friends and loved ones about how you're feeling. If you're having a tough time, ask for help and support or say, hey, I really care about you. I don't feel up to meeting tonight. That's really important. 
be honest with yourself, I think that's the hardest thing for any of us to do. When I got diagnosed with ADHD, one of the things I said was, this is the greatest secret I've ever kept, and it was from myself. So be honest with yourself, listen to your attention and pay attention to the clues and evidence in your body. Um, and ask for help from your friends, from your colleagues, um, from your management. Um, and sometimes it can be so life-changing. So I know that since I've started focusing on the things I'm great at and asking for help with the things that I'm not so good at, instead of feeling upset or silly that I'm not good at something, I'm actually re-focusing my time elsewhere and that's been a big change in my energy and in my business too. And so I hope some of those things have touched you today or resonated with you. I really appreciate your time for anyone watching. Um, I do want to close and say this is my lived experience. So other people may have different experiences of ADHD or neurodiversity. Please do go and do your research, get educated, support neurodivergent content creators and researchers. They put a lot of time and energy into that, so pay them. Um, and really just look out for each other because it can be a wild world out there. And that's all from me. Thank you.